Hey everyone, it's your boy Richard Graves. I'm here today on History of House. We have a very special guest tonight. We have Mr. Mario Smokin Diaz of the Hot Mix Five. Uh, a lot of people have been looking forward to me interviewing Mario. Um, you all may know him, for obviously, when he was on the radio, all the club DJing he did, uh, some of the releases that he did on DJ International, um, Let's Do It, um, and uh, Fusion Dance, and a few other things that he's done. But without me talking about him, I'm going to let him talk about him. And uh, again, this is a gentleman who I've been a fan of his DJing and a fan of his music uh, for quite some time. So I'm looking forward to having this discussion. And without further ado, Mr. Mario Diaz, how you doing, sir? Hey, hey, Rich. How are you? All right. Well, thank you again for coming on the History of House show. Um, you know, it's, it's good to hear from a lot of people that we don't normally hear from in some of the house documentaries or some of the house articles, you know. I'm always saying that this was a very much a group effort uh, that happened in Chicago. Of course, we had our originators and our godfathers and our kings, but we also have everybody else who pushed the line and pushed the music forward, and you're one of those people. So um, without going any further, and I'm going to try to remain not a fan and talk to you like a historian. So I'm going to ask you, uh, first, um, um, I, I met you a couple times back in the day when I used to hang out with Hitman and Julian uh, at a few different spots. But I most recently saw you uh, with Benji, rest in peace, Benji Espinoza uh, from DJ International Records. And in fact, this shirt, this DJ International shirt is one that Benji gave me. Uh, great guy. Uh, he brought you out. I think I had Mickey Oliver out for a party I was doing out in Naperville. And you came with uh, Benji. We all had a pretty good time. And, um, you know, I was just thank you for supporting me on that. Uh, so other than that, man, um, let me start out by first asking, how did you get in, even get into music in the first place? Well, I'm pretty sure that you hear this this answer from a lot of people because <laughs> I was a kid, right? And it's, it's really, truly, that's that's what happened. You know, I, I remember uh, since I was in my, I get 10, 11 years old, uh, I, I started loving music. Uh, I remember being in a family party records myself you know I, i'll be I'll, I'll be the one playing the records and in, 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 in the old stereos you know <laughs> so and and i saw that control and that control of music had over people and i loved it i, I just love i feel in love with it. um and um so that was one of my my first experiences you know just at home you know in family parties uh and then uh, i remember early in um in those years where I started buying my own records, um, I remember uh, buying my first record, my first 45, Ben McCoy, The Hustle. That was one of my first records that I ever bought, out of my pocket. <laughs> so it, it, this is early from, from, from back then. Uh, I collected more records uh, as, as time went on. Uh, and it just, I, I, I love the music, you know. I remember the sounds of Philadelphia, uh, I love all that, all that stuff that came out of that that those labels back then, um, and uh, remember uh, Barry White, uh, one of my number one record, which is the Team Love uh, back in that day uh, when it first came out was called the Team Love of '74, <laughs> and now we're telling our age, huh? Um, so that was one of the my favorite albums that I that I bought and I still have, um, and that's still my number one record, my own, my number one song. I think uh, the arrangement and 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 the production of that record is is is, is always take me, you know, uh, to the best, to the best uh, that I could hear of, of a song being made. So uh, that's still number my number one record. Wow, and you know, it's always good to hear from you guys. Um, I think it's a testimony to Chicago DJs from the, that era and our era that we were able to enjoy music across the board from various different places, whether it was a tallow disco or old school R&B or, you know, stuff that was coming out of Philly International or stuff that was coming out of Prelude or even some of the new wave music. We had an open air for just what was good music. You know, it's interesting, yeah. you know, that you point out the orchestration that, um, that Barry White had, you know, he's a great composer as well as a writer and a singer. So, I love a lot of his music. Wow. So, how did you get into actually DJing? Did you start with parties? You started in the air? Yeah, but basically, um, 
I started, uh, and it was all, I, I don't know if it's called, people call it destiny. I think some things come in together you know, somehow in life. You know, um, I was in high school. Um, one of my friends uh, actually played in a club. Uh, I, used to be, uh, I grew up in the north side in Rogers Park. Uh, I went to Sullivan High School. Uh, a, lot of people, um, a lot of people don't know where, where this whole house thing you know, or it actually kind of started the whole thing. Uh, but we'll, we'll get into that, though. Um, first, uh, let me ask you a question. You basically, uh, this 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 guy uh, is a friend of mine. Worked in a club, and they had a live band uh, in the club on, on the weekends. And he used to work there on, on Fridays. What he did, he um, he used to play the records in between uh, the band breaks. So the, the the band will go on a break for fifteen minutes, and he'll play records. Now he we the setup was there. I I have no idea. You know, I, I, there was a mixer, and there were twelve hundreds or eleven hundred something like that back in the day. But there was no blending. Nobody knew about blending because we were talking. We're talking. This is before, right before the '80s. Um, and um, what would what he would do? He would play one record and then fade it. Once it's by the end, he'll fade it into the next record. So he he'll use the system, but not not the blending part. Uh, so uh, one day he asked me to come by. He's like, hey, you know, uh, we were young, you in high school, you know, they're like, hey, you got to go see the pretty girls, man, to come to this club, you know, we were underage, you know, and I was like, sure, why not, you know, let's, let's have a good time. So one day I decided to go with him uh, to this club um, and I, I observed everything, you know, it was great. I mean, people were having a good time and then he'll play the records and and that's that's basically like damn you know I've, I've been doing this before when i was a kid at home but now i'm seeing it live you know it's just like more powerful you know mm -hmm. uh so uh every friday <laughs> i was there <laughs> every friday i was going going with him basically uh after uh several fridays that uh that i went with him one day he had a party uh, uh, uh some kind of personal uh, private party and he asked me he goes hey uh, uh you want to do the club tonight because i can't make it and I said, sure, because he showed me how to turn all the equipment up and how to, how to play and observing what he was doing. He showed me how to how to work uh, the system. So I said, sure, why not? So I went there uh, that day that he, he didn't show up and um, got it and I had a great time. I mean, everything went fine. Uh, and then, then plus that, you get paid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I was like, wait a minute, this is like plus, 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 you know? So everything was a plus. It was uh, it was a good atmosphere. Uh, you get to see the pretty girls, and then uh, and then uh, you sometimes you maybe sneak in a drink there, <laughs> and then plus you get paid. So I was like, wow, I love this. This is this is great. You know? <laughs> so um, that's 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 what started. Just basically, I, I loved it from, from that point. You know? Just uh, basically, that's how I really got into being clubs more. So, like the beginning right there um, wow that's that's a that's a good beginning so you said that the djs um at that time with the 1100s or 1500s whatever they had they weren't really blending what got you into actually blending of records well uh what, what happened after that is like i said we're talking about the i don't know if it's any or not <laughs> but things just fall in place you know um i i used to i used to hang around this record called roberts Right on Howard Street, right on the hill, almost. Uh, Corey Chillhart, uh, one of my best friends, he was also a music crotch. He was phenomenal, you know, back in the day. But he'll be throwing records right behind. He'll be scratching and throwing them back. You know, he'll be catching the records, and I uh, like, wow, man, this you know, this is this is great. Um, I used to hang around there all the, you know, after school, I used to go to the record store and just uh, run with him and his buddy, buddy Dwayne. I think that was doing. Uh, both they were basically the sellers and the record. Uh, owner was doing what? So they do I sell a lot of records. Now you see a whole whole bunch of characters coming into there. Um, and I, I I remember seeing one guy that uh, one kid that used to go to school with me. And I've I have seen him in the school and he used to buy doubles of every record. You know, he's like um, he had money. He had a lot of money. Other owners, store. Uh, a grocery store. 
you can come in there and say, well, give me two of these, two of that. What's, what's new? What's new? Corey will play. He'll take two of those, give him two of those, two of those, two of those. One day, um, he was there almost every two by records. And one day I asked him, I said, hey, uh, why, why do you always buy two records of the same song? He goes, you know, because we do own remixes. What do you mean, you own remix? He goes, oh, yeah, I know you have. So I said, yeah, you go to school here. And then I happen to know some people that of, uh, one day I went to his house. He, had, he didn't have 1200s. It was just belt drive turntables where you had to actually break, you know, like try to line up the beat. You know, you actually break, uh, had to like put your finger to stop almost the record for, for spinning. Um, so uh, uh, I said, where did you learn this? And he goes, well, you know, I lived in New York. And uh, they doing this in New York. You know, they bring records. I'm like, wow, I never heard it. And, uh, and then the, the thing that just blew my mind, he put a record on the same spot on both sides of, of the same album, on the same spot. And all these things start coming out. He started calling a fake, 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 fake. I'm like, what's fake? Like, wow. He was, look at sounds. He, he, he put it without it, then he put it put the fade in the middle. And it's like, see the sound? I'm like, wow. I said, like, that's, man, that's out of this world. You know, it's like, it just blew my mind, you know? So, man, I just, I started hanging around with him. You know, start hanging around with him uh, uh, just because, you know, start learning. I just start learning how to do the, the blending back. It's just so funny because not too far from that point, he comes to help me So we we'll so they come up. Mix. I'm like, wow, this is something I've been doing, you know, something I've been trying to learn how to do. So it, it, it's just, it's like I said, everything just falling in, falling in place. Wow. Yeah, you know, I think that's a similar story a lot of people have now. As far as blending records, we had some DJs out where I'm from that used to blend records. Uh, George and Greg Reddick, and uh, we had a guy, uh, Tony Spikner. So I, I would watch them blend. And of course, the Hot Mix 5 was on the radio, mm -hmm. and I would hear them. And I got to go to Dilla Gaps, and I saw Julian do it actually in person. And that's what made me go, oh, I want to do that. But you're right, that you know, that playing the two records at the same time and and the effect that, you know, when it, one's going slightly slower or as they shift and it gives it that weird effect that, you know, it's like the, it broadens the sound. And uh, yeah, you know, that, 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 that was one of the, I mean, it's, it's a, it seems like a simple thing, but it's something that really creates ambiance in the party. Yes. Yes. Oh, so it's, it's just, uh, that's, that's how the whole really big started for me. More, I got more into, more into it um, as it, the time went by, um, I started learning more. I, I used to spend hours and hours. Uh, we were able to, um, when I actually moved out of my house, uh, I moved out of my house really young. Um, I, I, I was able to get a with a roommate, a good friend of mine. Uh, we put a setup, you know, uh, he, was, we, he got me the job working. We, were able to, we, we put a setup, we actually bought a whole hundred. He's in the with a whole bunch of records. Uh, trying to learn how to do it right. Mm -hmm. So, because uh, when I start uh, actually looking into the New York uh, movement, uh, I found out like when Jelly was doing and some of the cats from over there, they were, f they were actually blending records, but they were blending them in the wrong spot. You know? They'll, they'll be blending records, vocals with vocals, with classic records. The, the, the blending will be on beat, but it will be like in the wrong spots. Mm -hmm. we, could, we could do something better. We, we, could, we, could, we could prove the records blending in certain parts where we actually um, would actually sound better. I think that's mostly of the Chicago DJ, the trademark of the Chicago that we actually start making Back then, the records were not made for DJ, mm -hmm. uh, so we had to we had to try to find spots where uh, we actually could mix record with another record. That was challenging. You also have um, the whole uh, process of, of trying to mix a record with another record that was not all electronic. Actually, uh, dance actually. 
with some of these records. So you know, like the beat, the beats or the drummer would not be, it would not be a perfect beat, you know, because the thing, this thing was not electronic. So a, a, a human being is not a perfect beat. You know? So there'll be, there'll be parts where, where the, actually the beats will slow down. So you have to be careful. You kind of have to play with the, with the, the, with the pitch. Mm -hmm. You know, we got to go up and down, up and down, make sure to try to line up the beats. So that's what the one turn back. Once the electronic music started, the drum machines are perfect. It was a lot easier to line up a record with another record because mm -hmm. already used to trying to line up live bands, you know, or, or, or bands that were recorded at certain records. So that was that was a good that, that was a good plus. Right, mm -hmm. and I and I remember I was a kid too when I was playing with trying to DJ my mom's old disco records, like you know mixing mixing. Black Ivory or mixing Hot Shot or Deputy of Love or, you know, and of course, like you said, they're live drummers. So a live drummer is going to eventually slow down or speed up. Yeah. So it does get you real good at blending because you got one, you got to know the record. You got to know when that's going to happen. Yes. Or at least you got to be good enough that when it happens, kind of hear it and move with it. And you learn. So when we started doing that, when I started mixing some of the electro stuff or the Italo disco stuff, you know, that was made by, you know, a Lindrum or 909 or 808. And, oh, that was gravy, man. It was like, you yeah. know. I have a perfect beat, so. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that was easy. That's easy to. So these DJs now with Serato and Record Box and all that stuff, I don't think they understand, <laughs> you know, because yeah. sometimes I'll be DJing on my on, on Record Box or Serato. And you got songs that, you know, that they always push the beat match and, and they'll be like, how are you doing that? It's not matching beat. Well, you know, I'm going to listen to it. And I'm just going to blend the record. You yeah. know, use the pitch control. Yeah, they're doing all the struggle. <laughs> yeah. But that is the uh, trademark of Chicago Hot Mix DJs. That you is. Know, yeah. I mean, everybody took it from there on. You know, uh, actually, the new the new artists, the time went by, they, they make, are making songs a little bit more DJ friendly. You know, where now it's Probably did your friendly when you have a whole intro and a whole break. So you mm -hmm. have to blend a record in and blend it out. So, uh, yeah, of course, a lot. Yeah, with us back then, that's when the beat tracks I had, I had Vince Lawrence on. And, you know, he was talking about when they made On and On and all those beat tracks on the other side of On and On or Faces Drums or Virgo tracks or Mix Your Own Stars. So if it was a particularly difficult disco song, you're trying to get from one or the other, you throw on faces, drums, or Virgo or some, and get your little break and catch yeah. your breath and then start over, basically. I mean, you, you have to get creative, you know. Back mm -hmm. then, we had to really get creative. Uh, the same thing with the records, you know. You have those records were not made strictly for dance. You know, you have most of the records that came out after the disco era uh, were were made to dance, but there were certain parts where people love more than other parts. There, there'll be parts where the record will get boring, you know. And, and so, so one of the things that we got creative was uh, um, to try to play the same part, you know, over and over, you know, to get to keep the crowd going, you know. Uh, so uh, it, we had to get creative, you know. You, you had, if, if the part came in the beginning of the song, you try to keep the, the beginning of the song, and then you go to another part in the middle where it's also, you know, jamming, and you come out of the record, go into the next record. So that was, you have to get creative because sometimes when those, when those records come in their lower point, you know, a lot of people will walk out of, uh, out of the dance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. hey, yeah, and I think that's the thing that people need to understand about hot mix. And like you said, there's songs that are great, that have these great parts and, you know, and there, and then we have to get from that part, blend to the other part, blend it back to that part, and then mix out of it. You know, so we're kind of remixing with the twelves yes. as we go along. Yeah, yeah. As I, people, you know, right in the beginning of the years when I when I actually started working on the first clubs, uh, they would ask me, "Hey, where did you get that ver that, that that version of that song? I never heard it." I was like, "No, I'm just doing this live," because <laughs> <laughs> uh, they, they didn't know some people that were into the music. They're like, "Well, that's all. I, I got that song, man. It doesn't go like, that, you know, it's like you you playing a little. Where did you get that remix?" <laughs> exactly. You own remix, you know. So yeah, that was one of the the major uh, uh, questions that we used to get there. You know, to play the club. Wow. Yeah, I remember um, hearing you guys when I would hear you guys on the radio sometimes how disappointed we'd be 
after we get the imports and buy the song. <laughs> and we go we go to the gramophone to buy the song, come back, and we have to wait. We're listening to this song. We got to find where you were at with it. When we're like, oh, man. <laughs> you know. Yeah. So now we got to learn how to mix, too. Yeah. And you got to do the your own remixes without losing the beat, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Wow, man. So yeah, I mean, this is this is who you're talking right in the beginning of, of when we started doing this here in Chicago, you know, um, and and um, I'm happy, I'm glad that I was part of it, you know. Uh, I can I guess I came into a part where uh, some of the older DJs uh, that were retiring at that time uh, didn't know nothing about the blending, you know. I remember the, uh, one of the first clubs where I work at, which AKA. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I have a whole story about AK because <laughs> uh, that, that was one of the things that got, got actually helped me, you know, to get to the point where, where you know, I, I became to to be more known with uh, with with crowd and with people, you know, and it got me into the radio. Uh, but uh, when when I started working at AK, um, uh, the one of the managers was actually a DJ. They used to DJ back in the day at, at, at Cross Street uh, Division. And, um, and what he used to do, you know, just blend one record, one, not blend them, you know, but just start one record at the end, play the other record. And we actually saw me, when he actually saw me blending the records, um, he was, I blew his mind, you know, I was like, wow, how'd you do that? You know, so it, we came apart where I, I guess our time was coming to that part where we start getting more creative, uh, playing music, you know, and that's like, I think that's our, our era, you know, mm -hmm. that. Um, so basically it, you know, I mean, uh, going back to the clubs, I, I mean, uh, the first, I think the first clubs that I, I play, I mean, you obviously know that the first little club that I used to be playing there on Fridays between the band. Uh, but then my first, my first chance became actually in AK. Uh, I have it in AK was, um, this, this club, I don't, are you familiar with AK a little bit? North side, what's on Lincoln? No, it was actually on Broadway. Broadway, okay, okay. I I had been there a couple of times. I knew it was up north. Yeah, Broadway near. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and it was basically it had two names before it became. Uh, we called Betty Sue's. Uh, it was above all this. Uh, the club was basically more geared to all the students. For Loyola University, uh, well, that was their crowd. That was where they built the, the of students. When the way I got the, the now, Mario, mm -hmm. I'm not trying to interrupt you, but your mic is kind of still kind of going in and out. So, uh, okay, how's that? Is that a little better? Let me see. I just put this on my phone. How's that? That's fine. Okay. Yes, yeah, so because I want people to get the history that I want them to hear that. <laughs> well, basically, uh, when I started playing, actually in the club, my first club, or actually one of my first clubs, uh, I, I knew a, this girl that was going out with my roommate, uh, and she worked at, at the McDonald's right next to AKA. Are you there? Okay. Yeah, I'm still here. I was oh. doing some adjustments. <laughs> Let people focus on you. <laughs> I see. Okay. So um, this girl used to work at the McDonald's. Uh, she used to go out with, with my roommate. And um, she used to see the owner and one of the, the accountants during the day uh, because they were, I guess the accountant was there doing his work uh, from the club and he would come have lunch at the McDonald's right next to it. And... Um, Back then, uh, the tin clothes were kind of hot at, at, at that time. We had this club called McGreevy's at that time, and, and, and they were pulling a whole bunch of people over there. So she brought the idea to the owner about having a tin night at, at AKA. Um, and he's like, uh, start talking and inquiring more about it, uh, because actually the club was was closed on, on, on Sundays. And he said, well, you know, what, what these clubs do is they only sell... Uh, uh, soda pop, you know, uh, soda, and they don't sell any liquor, and they let the teenagers go in there. Um, and so they looked into more, and then they asked, are asking them more questions. 
uh, it, it came to a point where they're like, yeah, well, let's try it. Uh, and she brought up my name. She was, you know, I knew this guy is, uh, is, is, uh, is the, ro the roommate of my boyfriend and, uh, and he, um, you know, they're DJs and, you know, he's trying to get, uh, trying to get uh, a spot to work play. Um, so what happened was, um, they, they do agree to have a Sunday. Uh, and I came to that Sunday and I came all prepared with my records and here I am all getting ready. And, uh, actually, you know, you invite everybody in the neighborhood, you know, uh, and actually we had a good, a good, re uh, a good crowd. We had a good reaction on it. Uh, we, we put a lot of kids in there and, and we were jamming, you know, we, we were jamming, uh, and, and I was playing. And like I said, that's that's when one of the managers came up to me, and that's what he told me that he was uh, he was uh, the DJ at uh, at Sluggers or something like that, one of the one of the clubs in Division Street. He goes, "Oh, I never saw that before." That's when he, that's when I you know when I was like, "Wow, how did you do this?" You know, how did I remember playing? Uh, uh, you want to be starting something? And, you know, I had that song. Like, ta, ta, ta. You go, oh yeah. I go ta 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 ta, and it's like wow, and it's all one beat, and so, and so he's like, "Wow." Right, so it's like, well, how how do you like to do it next next week? I'm like, sure, let's do it. Right? So, and they saw that they were making money. You know, they they, they had a whole bunch of kids coming in there. The all the things they sell was you know Coke, Seven Up, or whatever they had. You know, and the fountain, and they were you know they they were they were fine with it. So we did it. I I, I said we did it a couple more times. Uh, and, uh, one day he called me on a Thursday. And he goes, hey, uh, what are you doing tonight? I'm like, nothing really. I mean, I was working during the day. He goes, uh, how would you like to come uh, work at the club today? I said, well, you know, I'm underage. He goes, well, don't worry about it. Just stay in the booth. Just stay in the DJ booth. Now they had a beautiful booth. Because it was so big. They were doing also videos. They were doing a music video. Uh, so, uh, sure, I, I agreed to come in. Um, and he said, well, the only thing is, is a little bit different than what you do on a Sunday uh, because our crowd is different. You have the, the young college kids, you know, maybe come to the club. You have to play uh, U2, uh, uh, Billy Idol stuff, B-52s. Uh, <laughs> so the thing about it was, like, I came in on to work that Thursday and I'm like, wait a minute. And they had the beats per minute in each record. They had uh, the DJ that was there. He actually had the time to put the beats per minute. I'm like, wait a minute. This this song goes with this song. So I could mix it. So I was mixing Billy Idol with B-52s, you know, Romeo Boy. And so I, it's like a lot of the new wave, you know, back mm -hmm. in the early new wave. And uh, and the guy was like, whoa. And, and all, the, all the crowd was like freaking out, you know, how... Uh, they're coming like, hey, where'd you get an album from? Where'd you get that album? You know, this is this is that one record going to another record, you know? Wow. <laughs> like, no, no, I didn't get I'm just doing it myself. So it, it, it made a good, great impression, you know, at that time. So what happened was uh, he told me, you know, that the DJ that works on, on Thursday, he's he called in sick, you know, that's why we got you. He goes, well, how would you like to come back, come back tomorrow? <laughs> wow. So I'm like, sure, no problem. So I came in the next day, and I'm playing, and all of a sudden this this kid comes by. He's all pissed off. He's like a new wavish kid, you know, and he's grabbing all these records. This is my, this is my shit. This is my, and uh, and it's like wow. So I guess he just got fired. <laughs> <laughs> so now they gave me they gave me to come in on Fridays, Thursday, Fridays, and Saturdays at AKB. Wow, I'm playing all this stuff. Um, basically, I mean, you had uh, what was that? Uh, movie tra soundtracks that were back then. Uh, you had uh, Dancing in the Sheets. What was that movie? Um, I, I forgot what that movie Footloose? was. No, it wasn't Footloose. Yeah, it was Footloose. Yeah. Footloose, Footloose Dancing in the Sheets. Okay. Yeah, Dancing with the Sheets and Footloose. So I was mixing all this stuff, man. You know, so it, it's just, uh, it just, it, they just love it. The crowd loved it and everything. Um, and as the time went by, I started changing the crowd a little bit more because I would put in, I'm like, oh, He'll come to me and say, "Hey man, say that stuff." He goes, "We don't want to attract that kind of." <laughs> don't want to attract that type of crowd. Like, what do you mean? You know. So I had to be careful. I had to, you know, I had to play uh, what they wanted to hear, but I was sneaking one or two records. You know. Um, the thing about it, though, 
once we start getting a different crowd, okay, the place start getting packed. We start getting that place packed. And see, one of the things that, um, that the club had uh, that they would with, with the college kids, they weren't really spending a lot of money into the club. They'll come in the days they had uh, 50, 50 cent beers or free wings or something like that, you know. That's when they had the crowds. When I started changing the crowd there, um, uh, we had everything. You know, we have whites, blacks, Hispanics, and we were packed. We were packed on the weekends. I mean, we couldn't put a, 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 a person in there. That's how packed it was. So, yeah, of course, they, they, the clubs started making a lot of money, you know. And that was just basically the first club where I, you know, when I started. So I, I, I made the transition from what the club was to what it became after that. Because after that, after a couple of years after that, I, I was able to invite some of the guys. You know, I, I was able to invite Kenny and uh, Farley and some of the guys there. Then eventually the club was sold um, to these uh, Asian guys. And then the Asian guys were a little bit more open-minded. And... They're the ones that actually brought Ron Hardy and they, they brought Farley again and and they brought and brought uh, uh, Frankie over there. So, you know, it's just the club went from one, one end to the other, you know? Yeah, right. Well, so, yeah, that's basically uh, that's how I started doing the um, club. I was actually making my living out of, out of, I really didn't have a job in the morning. I once I started the clubs, that's all I was doing. Wow. So and, and and it kills me now. You are deep, but everybody. Oh, I remember the car. I went to buy my first car. And what do you do for it? Now I'm at this job. Now, yeah, again, your mic is kind of doing that again. I just wanted people to hear what you said. Yeah. Could you repeat that? Because your mic was kind of going. Oh, in. okay. Uh, what I was saying is about the DJs now and then. Sometimes it kills me that you hear some of the, some of the DJs uh, um, saying um, they're just a DJ just because it's, it's, it's bad, you know? They don't know really the struggles that we went through. I remember going to get my first car back in the day when they were asking me, what was my question? What was my question? That was this back. Tell us that. Oh, it's like, well, this is what I do play records. I'm not a, not a professional. Mm -hmm. I end up getting the car, but I had to get a co signer. <laughs> wow. Yeah, but, you know, it's just, it's just like we went through the struggle. So actually going to what a real DJ is. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not putting my, anything, but we went through it. You know, we actually went through it. What a real DJ is. Now, mm -hmm. on what, where everybody always did. Mm -hmm. so, people need to realize how serious this was. It was but to me it was because I was actually killed. You know, playing music. So it, uh, okay, I'm sorry. You you went like completely out there for a second. Okay. I'm sorry. It's okay. How how how's all right? Say a couple things so we can see if you, you hear me. Yep. A little bit better, but you still, it's like kind of, it's choppy. I don't know. Is it external or is it just a computer mic? No, it's just external. Okay. Let me see if I could do something here, but I don't want to move it. How's that? Okay. You sound a lot better. Maybe if I get closer, I don't know. Yeah, maybe. Okay. How's that sound now? It sounds good. Okay. So, yeah, just, just basically, uh, you know, what I was trying to say is, uh, uh, people have need to realize now that it, it wasn't just a fat for us that we, we our life, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, we we like I, said, I, I pay my bills out of, out of records for many years. Uh, but I like to say like I just I mean if myself a controller, you know, and I'm a DJ, you know. Yeah, it's a different thing now, and 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 
people have to understand that uh, passionate about what I did. I'm so passionate about it, and I'm probably going to die doing this mm -hmm. because I'm I'm so passionate about what I'm doing uh, when it comes to being a DJ. You know, I'm not just a DJ, a DJ because uh, it was that, you know, like nowadays, it, it was a lifestyle, that's a life life, you know, being a DJ. I think, yeah, it was very different back then. I mean, we, those was, we threw parties occasionally. We got to, you know, DJ at some of the clubs. I, I remember I DJed at Dilla Gas a couple of times, got to DJ at Janelle's up north a couple of times. And Mr. Patoy allowed me to DJ a couple of his events, you know. So, and you, got, you know, it's back then it, it wasn't like like now, like you said, you couldn't just go get you a controller and download some software and be and be doing it. You had to learn how to do it. You know, you had to you had to make an investment. I mean, I started with belt driven turntables with those Technique B2s. And by the time I got some 12s, I think. I, but they made you a better DJ with the belt driven of ones. Of course. Yeah. I mean, you know, when you go to the two the, the, the things the hard way, I guess when you actually get the right stuff, it, it becomes easy. You know, it was easy. <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, because I went to AKs. I think I saw you up there one time and then I saw Ron. That was one of the places I saw Ron Hardy twice, DJ. Once was at AKAs and once was at uh, the Music Box. You know, um, so um, how did, all right, because I know you were a club DJ. How did you end up getting on uh, the radio? Because I think you got on WGCI first. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, but basically, uh, I mean, I, I got to meet some of the guys. I got to meet Kenny uh, through Matt Warren, uh, Matt the Mighty Warren, you know, uh, with some of the guys from the North Side that were big, big names over there, you know. Uh, and I, I met him through him. I said, hey, man, why don't we uh, bring Kenny to the club? You know, uh, we, we brought him in and, uh, on a New Year's and a New, New Year's uh, party one day. Uh, and I got to be uh, pretty cool with him, with me, with with Kenny. So I got to meet some of the guys, uh, mainly him. Um, what happened was uh, there was this uh, uh, radio personality from GPI that used to come every Thursday to AK. His name uh, is Evan Locke. I don't know if you remember. Him. He used to have the, uh, I think it was the evening shift on GC. Yeah. And all this time I thought he was black, but he's actually a white dude. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he uh, he came up to me. He goes, you know, I, I come here every Thursday and I, I listen to you. He goes, how would you like to be on the radio? You know, how we, we trying to put something together to go against the happening spot. Because I, I guess they were losing their ratings. Uh, oh, yeah, to BMX? To BMX. And, and you know, uh, GCI was owned by a, a multi-million dollar corporation, corporation. And when they saw that, they're like, wait a minute, we can't let this happen. Mm -hmm. so what I had to do, they tried to uh, make their own team to go against the uh, And uh, that's, how, that's how the whole thing started. I, I mean, he came up to me and he said, well, we're going to have a meeting, you know, this day, this day, you don't know anybody else. Uh, I have mentioned to him, uh, Matt Warren, in, uh, in Carlos Valderrama, because they actually play AKA also one time. Uh, they got, uh, we had the meeting, uh, the two six of us, and they called it the Master Mix uh, it was uh, It was Carlos Valderrama, Matt Warren, myself, Fast Eddie, um, Jam Master J, Charles Nelson, and I forgot who the other one guy was. But it was six of us. And they said, well, this is, this is what we're going to do. Uh, we're gonna have a show and this, 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 and that. So that's how the whole thing started. Uh, we, we went on the air. Uh, they got our names and, and they start promoting us and try to basically go against the Hot Mix Five. Wow. Because they came to a point where I could be MX like one, one format one day. So they had, you know how they do their ratings every six months, something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, their ratings in six months. Also, because a lot of people got fired on that. And fired. A lot of people got fired because BMX yeah. beat them. Yeah, yes. I well, remember the, the the program director. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> like you know, that's how radio was back in the day because they make so much money on on the commercials. You know, and the more audience that they have, the more money they make. But so right. in one point on those ratings back in the day, it meant a lot to these radio stations. Now you have a multi-million dollar company losing against a basically what do you call a uh, self? I don't know what it was called, BMX, but it was 
actually it was uh, I remember going to the studios back in Oak Park and uh it was it was a second floor of an old men's oh, yeah, old a uh, res- uh, uh, old uh, old folks home old folks home it was yeah. uh, you know they had the studio up there so like I mean you see I wasn't uh, right on Michigan Avenue you know mm-hmm. working there when when it was on Randolph in Michigan and then they moved to Michigan and Jackson um, so, I mean, you're talking big money against little money, so they couldn't stand that. So <laughs> what they did is, um, basically, and I think the whole idea, I'm going to tell you what happened. Uh, this is my opinion, uh, because eventually when they got rid of, when they lost the writings, they broke, they actually hired, uh, they actually hired the program director of BMX to come to GCI. Wow. I think the whole idea was to bring the Hopnix Five to GTI. That was their whole idea. They they, they want to re- disrupt that. The 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 good thing that the Hopnix Five was having in BMX because they were being successful mm-hmm. doing the mixes over there. So and and that's 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 my that's my that's what I think that happened. Mm-hmm. The, the program director and what they did is they ties the Hopnix Five to come. No. Up that mm-hmm. now, I think that when that happened, didn't I think Farley went over there, right? Well, Farley first came over and uh, he said, Well, you know, uh, I'm gonna take over. They gave, they gave him the power to take over the mix show. Uh, he basically said, Uh, well, we're gonna keep some of the guys, we're gonna get rid of some of the guys. So he kept me, uh, uh, he kept a couple, a couple of the guys I don't remember, Fastly, I believe, yeah, exactly who, but uh, he kept some of the guys, um. Uh, to continue doing the mixes, then he wanted to call us a jackmaster six, whatever, which never happened. <laughs> it was called Master Mix Six. Uh, that sounds like Farley. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Farley. I love him though because he we all love Farley. He actually gave me the opportunity uh, to continue being under it. I'm thankful for that. Uh, a few months after that, um, then they tried to bring the whole hot mix five over. What happened was uh, when the Hot Mix Five came over, uh, what happened was, um, let me just, I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be the more uh, accurate that I can. No problem. I don't want to, I don't want to say something that is not, you know, that's, hey, that's, you know, uh, but what happened was uh, the Hot Mix Five at that time was uh, Kenny, Mickey, Ralphie, Farley, and Julian. Mm-hmm. Uh, when they came over, uh, they left Julian behind. Uh, uh, Farley was already in GCI. Uh, Kenny, Mickey, and, and Ralphie came over. What happened was uh, they left Julian behind to continue doing the mix for, for BMX. Now, for what I for what I understood or for what I was told was that Farley was offered more money to go back to BMX. So he went right back to BMX, and uh, and then he, um, I guess he got Julian, and then he got, I think he got uh, Frankie Rodriguez, uh, he got Bad Boy Bill in it, I think. Uh, mm-hmm. They made their own little group. Right. Yeah, and Hitman went over there too. Yeah. yeah. What happened was uh, when GCI, when when the rest of the guys of the Hamix fight came over, it, it it was only, it was only Mickey, Ralphie, and Kenny. So what happened was um, they kept me, they kept me on. So it was only four of us. Uh, was it Ken, Mickey? Um, no, no, I'm sorry. That was Kenny. They came out like, you know, we, we need to kind of reflect the, the whole audience that we are. We, we all either Hispanic or white. We need to get somebody else here, you know, to represent, you know, diversity. And I, I think uh, uh, Kenny, uh, he was a good friend of, of Edward Crosby. Mm-hmm. So we get down Crosby. Get down Crosby. So uh, he brought a work at down Crosby to the. So that we were uh, for a little while. We were, you know, us 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 five. We get down myself, Mickey, Kenny, and Ralph. Now we had a big meeting with with the administrators or the big bosses. Uh, I remember Marv Dyson there, mm-hmm. uh, and some of the uh, executives from GCI. And what they were thinking about it was uh, they were asked uh, to the rest of the guys, we're all sitting down and say, okay, guys, how are we here now? This is what we're going to offer. This is what we're going to do. Uh, do you guys want to change your name? Be- 
because you guys are not the original guy, you know. Uh, you guys want to be called something different, right? So because what they did is they said, we're going to promote the hell out of you guys. We're going to have they have a guy in, in in California that does all the voiceover. I don't know if you remember what he said. Yeah. Open the uh, something. Uh, mix. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that guy, they said, we're going to we're going to get you tags and all that stuff. I said, so we need to know what you guys will be calling yourselves. So at that point, uh, Mickey, Ralphie, and Kenny said, no, we're going to continue to be called the Hot Mix 5. So that's how, actually, officially, I became a part of the of the group, uh, along with Get Down. Mm-hmm. Now, I know that, but, you know, that's what happened. Uh, so, you know, they, eventually, you know, that uh, um, GCI did all our voiceovers. Uh, and one, one of the deals that we had was uh, they would give us the AM radio station. Which uh, because GCI had AM also, thirteen ninety uh, right? Yes, and so they said, "Well, we're going to have you guys do your own thing for four hours, from six o'clock to to ten o'clock, or six to nine o'clock, something like that." I don't remember. Five days a week, Monday to Friday, right? So you guys could talk, do whatever you want, just don't go crazy, right? Mm-hmm. And they said, "Whatever you guys are, uh, you know, able to do, you know, uh, go ahead and do it." You know, so we were playing mix. 1390, I remember that, you know. I would, my day was Monday, so I would come in on Monday and do my, my little three-hour show, and, uh, play mixes and talk to people and get requests and all that stuff. So uh, so that was one of the deals. Uh, I know the deal was some a lot, a lot of things that we were promised that they were going to give us an evidence. So that was, that, was, uh, that was a big thing. Uh, a lot of people said, well, you know, you were on the radio. I thought you were making all this money, you know, and stuff. But people don't realize that... Uh, they're, they're being just being on the radio station doesn't mean you're making a lot of money. Only certain people make a lot of money. Back in the day, there, uh, you know, we have we had uh, dog banks and uh, and Tom Joiner, Tom Joiner. They're making all the money. I mean, they were paying Tom Joiner fly back and forth from Dallas, and plus they were paying them all this money. You know? uh, and us, they kind of just threw a bone at us, you know, and they're like, it. <laughs> the only the only great thing about that though is that. We had the, the promo and the airtime, so our names got out there, you know, and 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 we used to make up some of that money uh, by getting gigs, you know, getting higher. Mm-hmm. Uh, there'd be a lot of uh, pro- uh, promoters out there and say, well, you know, I'm going to throw a party. Let's get uh, the Hot Mix 5. Let's get two guys to the Hot Mix 5, or three guys to the Hot Mix 5, or one guy to the Hot Mix 5. doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and let's get them so they could get more crowd in here stuff. And back then, you know, I mean, it was working. You know, I was I was busy. I, I never really had a, a real job <laughs> all that time, man. I was, I was just you know, I was I was maybe working Fridays, Saturdays, and sometimes on Sunday where there was no school on on Mondays, you know, a holiday or something, and I'll make my money for that for that week, you know, to 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 pay my bills and stuff. You know, uh, during the summer it was a little lower because uh, a lot of people would now go to the inside the clubs, you know, uh, they, and there were no festivals back. There were very few. I mean, we had the taste of Chicago and stuff, and the, the, the station would pay us a little money for going there and stuff. But, you know, just basically, you know, that's, that's the way it was, you know. Uh, and, and a lot of us are like, hey, man, we have more responsibilities. I can't, I can't, I can't live on this, you know. So yeah. a lot of people get real jobs. Wow. Yeah. So. And, yeah, and, I, and like I said, back then, you know, we promoted a lot of parties out in the West suburbs and me and like Mark Imperial and George Scott and stuff like that. So we'd always, you know, we'd hire Julian because we knew him um, or Hitman or Bill. But um, occasionally, you know, I would hire Ralphie a lot because, you know, I, I love Ralphie's mixes. And sometimes they'd get Steve Hurley or even you or uh, Kenny. We always bring out because if we brought one of you guys out, then we knew that everybody was going to come out and we get to be seen. <laughs> so. That was the whole point, you know, and, and you guys packed the party out and, you know, we did that out in West Suburbs, South Suburbs, North Suburbs. And, uh, you know, we used to go get our flyers printed up in Pronto and just have a good time with it, man. Everybody knew Pronto. <laughs> yeah. So um, I, I heard you on the radio. And I was like your mixes. But then you made uh, a record on DJ International. Um, Fusion. Now, you- I was like. Wow, man! You know you had to actually the 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 part of the record that we loved the most was your bonus beats on there. You yeah. know that boom, and you was it was banging, man. So you know I, I, I'm assuming you used a 909 or a Lindrum because that had a fat 
boom, to touch the boom, yeah. to you know, will come through. So how'd you, um, what, what made you decide to do that and how'd you do it? Well, you know, this, it's just, it's just, without getting so confused, um, you know, um, the fever of, of, of Chicago DJs making records, it, it all of a sudden started. You had, uh, you had, remember, had Matt Warren, one, one being one of the first persons actually, uh, actually printing a record. You know, he did a rap called uh, Rock the Nation, mm-hmm. uh, which was, this is before, this is before uh, Jesse Sanders or anybody. You know, he made a song called, uh, it's actually a rap, actually more like a hip house, you know, mm-hmm. but no house. So, and I remember him being one of the first persons uh, doing that. Um, this is the funny part though. Um, right around the time when Jess, Jesse Sanders, um, was making tracks, we were actually, everybody had the fever on this 909s. Um, uh, I went and got my 909 and I found out that the 909 had a pitch control. I didn't know that. So what you do is you make up a track, right? And you could actually mix it. You could actually put it connected to your mixer you could actually have a record going and then mix mix the the drum track you know uh, the trunk the the, the 99 into it you know so i started bringing my 909 to the club and that's what i was doing i would i would i would go into a song and then all of a sudden mix a track they had all these claps and all these all these uh kick drums and all this stuff and people would go crazy you know it's like wow look at this this is, this is insane right uh so Everybody started getting smart. You know, they're like, "Wait a minute, we could, if this, if this is people, what people like, let's let's put it on a record. Let's make some, let's make some money out of this, you know." And then being on the radio, we also help because anything that we were playing on the radio, people were looking at the next day. Yeah, I, I, yeah. yeah, I talked uh, talk to Paul Weiser, which is the owner, who was the owner of of, of imports. I will ask, they, they would ask me, or some of the guys that were over there, they asked me, hey, what did you play this week? Man, what was that song you played this week? And the people are just asking for it, you know? And I said, well, no, that was my drum track, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> or, or, that was a, or that was something that I got through somebody else. Uh, I, I, what I got into, it basically, I, I loved into the, going into the Italo. And I actually explored it a little bit more than the guys, the other guy, you know? I actually was playing some of the, some of the Italo stuff that nobody else was touching, you know, uh, uh, like everybody would touch the coro and you know, and the hypnotic tango and stuff. I would go a little bit more deeper, you know, and that's one of the things. I, I wanted to be a little different than the other guys. I wanted to be different. Uh, I don't want people to hear the same thing that everybody was playing. Of course, you know, there would come a, a brand new song that was happy. Of course, you had to play, you know, <laughs> just like everybody else, just, just like that. So. So that's that's how that's how it started. You know, it's like I had a whole bunch of tracks in my in my drum machine, you know, and then all of a sudden this this whole thing about uh, making your own music it started with all these guys. You know, I mean, you had Kenny Jason doing a track, you had this, and this is before before everybody started calling this house music. Mm-hmm. Remember house music being called? I used to when I used to work at AKA. Okay, we used to we used to call. Us, on the week on on Saturday, we used to close at three or four, four o'clock in the morning, I think. And I used to tell Matt Warren or some of the guys, oh Corey Hart. Corey Hart was the one that actually introduced me. He goes, Man, you gotta check out this club. It's called the Power Plant. It's a uh, it's by Caprini. I'm like, oh, that's kind of rough over there, but let's check it out. Right? Man, man. That was uh that was experience. I remember parking the car and about three blocks away and you could hear that bass. Holy, holy crap, what the hell is this? But once we got into the club, it's like, man, all these people jamming, dancing their asses off. And uh, and the sound system blew me away. It was whoever set up the sound system must have been an engineer because you could hear every single thing on a record, man. There were records that I'd never really like, and I just always don't like it, mm-hmm. you know? I remember walking in there and I listened to Tina Marie, you know, I need your love. And I was like, wow, man, I didn't know this song had all this stuff, you know, mm-hmm. all loud. And then whoever was running the lights would run the lights according to the music. So it was pitch dark in there, right? 
Mm-hmm. Then all of a sudden you got all of a sudden the lights come in with with the beat or whatever. It was it was it was amazing. It was amazing. It was a work. It was a a big room. Uh, but the way they had that set up, man, it was just out of this world, out of this world. You didn't even need no lasers or, or back then they didn't even use smoke, anything like that. It was just the, the lights itself, man, was just out of this world. You know, it's just, it's, it, from then on, man, I was going there every, every, every Saturday. <laughs> I get there four, five o'clock in the morning. I'll be walking out of there at 10, 10 o'clock in the morning. Wow. Yeah. And it's so pitch dark in there that you walk outside and the sun kind of hits you, you know, especially on the summer. You're like, holy crap, you know. Wow. So, and those, those, I mean, it, that just, I mean, it just blew my mind. You know, I, I, that's the first time I was able to see uh, uh, actually Frankie and, and Ron. Mm-hmm. So, it was just, it was amazing, bro. Amazing. Because what happened was that kind of influenced me a lot uh, on the music. Uh, influenced me a lot on on the way I wanted to play in in a club. Uh, when I qu- went back to AKA, a friend of mine, which was my roommate, I, I eventually got him. A, I got him a job working at AKA. Right? He knew about sound systems, and he, I say, man, we need to we need to pump this up, man. We need to pump this shit up, man. Mm-hmm. It, it, I was even, I was just this all 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 you know because of what I saw at the power plant. You know? But we say we 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 set up a good. Pretty good setup. After after it took us a little while, you know. But we 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 he ended up having a good setup where people actually did enjoy the music, you know. Because uh, you could play any record, man, and it just likes, you know. It just it just it it just it makes a difference, you know, when you have a good system and a, and a good show, you know. So it and, and that's actually you know. Uh, and then I I said, you know what? I'm I'm I got a whole bunch of tracks on my 909, man. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna you know just put them on vinyl, and, and then I you know found out the Rocky was you know starting his label, uh, you know uh, music is the key has just come out and I approached him, and, and Rocky used to Rocky and Benji used to come by by the club all the time, you know. And I said, oh, this is the track, and I used to play the track while I was playing for the for the crowd, and it's like, oh yeah, yeah, that's good, that's good. So you know, eventually uh, they got me into the studio and. Uh, and I eventually did two records with them. Uh, I did dance, and uh, and I did uh, let's do it. Let's do it. I just gotta say, man, that's one of my favorite cuts to this day. I still play that record. I like. I, it was composed very well, man. That boom, boom, ba doom, 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 doom. Bass line was hitting. String line was on point. You know the the way the drums were, and they would echo. Man, I mean people. I'm, I'm going to tell you what happened when I played that song. I went to Imports, and the song was out. I had heard it on the radio, and I heard, I don't know, I think it might have been Hitman was playing it. And it was like, there's a new beat, so the music's playing, right? And he's playing everything. So I said, I'm going to go get this. So I go to the record store on Saturday morning. Where I take the train to Chicago, go to Imports, see states. I say, hey, I need this this song. I go, there's a new beat. He's all this right there. So it's DJ. I'll say, it's DJ Nash. Give me two of them, right? So they give it to me at DJ a party that night. I think it was like in Bolingbroke or somewhere, you know, some skate uh, Main Street skate ring. That's where I was. So I go out. Nobody had it yet because no, nobody was able to get to Chicago quick enough. I got back. I was the only one with this record. And I'll never forget. I started to mix off. It was, There's a new beat. And it started beat boot and the crowd lost their mind. And then I remember I played it almost all the way through the version I played. And it was like, and I was playing two of, two of them at the same time. Uh-huh. So that echo really, it, it like yeah. fanned across the room. Crowd started screaming. And that's why it's still one of my favorites, because I still play that record, man. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, you know, thanks for uh, for the support that you guys had out there. Uh, oh, yeah, it's great. It's great. You know? And that's that's basically how we started. I mean, uh, uh, soon after that, uh, which I remember, uh, uh, then people started calling the Chicago house house music because I remember when I when I used to go to the power plant, they call house music the old uh, post disco music. Mm-hmm. Uh, they came out after disco, uh, the early '80s stuff. The Frankie and and, and Hardy and and Ron who were playing at the power plant, they were calling that house music. Mm-hmm. I remember calling house music. Though so our stuff was not called house music in the beginning. You know, for for everybody says yeah whatever. You know, I, I, you know, it's there's it, a lot of controversy controversy about this house music. Who started? Who's the king? And all this stuff. 
you know, and and I could only tell you what I saw. Mm-hmm. Okay, tell you that I was there when the whole thing was getting formed, when the whole thing became a big thing. Um, you know, so I remember them, those kids there. I don't know if they brought the the war from the warehouse. With some people say, yeah, the house mix started in the warehouse because people were, maybe the word came from the warehouse because Frankie was in the warehouse at one time. And then he came, then he then he, he was doing the, the power plant. So they brought that work with them in the, in the club. What happened was, what I saw is that when Frankie started playing uh, Chicago house, because I remember him playing uh, his house one time. I was like, well, what the hell is this? Man, this is cool. And, it, you know, Cheap East, his house, um, it, it was like, that's when people say, house, house, it's house. Mm-hmm. And everything that came out of Chicago was house music. So I think that's how uh, most of the f- name came from the Chicago music called house. You know, I mean, there's a lot of arguments about this. There's a lot of arguments about a lot of things, you know, and, and yeah. You know, I, I, I don't want to say something. I'm not a type of, that they want to go against some people say, and piss, piss people off for some things that I say. But, you know, like Benji, he was very, um, very oh. vocal about a lot of stuff, you know. Uh, but I, I could only tell you what I saw. Right. Into the house music, you know. Uh, I can't tell you something that I see. Uh, I see a lot of people now um, that were not there, you know. I'm not going to mention. I, I tell you, a lot of people that were not there, and and uh, a lot, I see a lot of people that said, said certain different things back in the day. That now they're changing their mind because house actually became something. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, so all I could tell you is this, man: um, house music was a cooperation of everybody. You know, a lot of people has this. Uh, well, outside DJs created this. But first of all. Most of the guys that did music back in the day were not DJs, or that I knew they weren't DJs. That I, mean, I never saw them playing in a club or on, on the radio. Most of the guys make great songs, you know. I mean, we have, uh, you know, Adonis, Marshall Jefferson, they make their songs, you know. I never knew they were DJs. I never had the, the knowledge, and, 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 you know, where they were in the area, you know, that's fine. I, I can't tell you that because I wasn't there. You know, all I could tell you is when they made the music, it was great, man. It was like, wow, man, this is this is great. This is this is not going to be better than just beat tracks, because we all started doing beat tracks. You know, just beat tracks, just playing the drum machine, and that's it. These cats were actually putting bass lines. They were playing, putting vocals into it. You know, they were making it a little bit more of a song now. Um, so I, I could tell you all the time that I was on the radio, I supported every single one of them. Every single one of the guys, uh, they made music at, at, at Tracks Records, uh, Precision, uh, Mitch Ball, mm-hmm. A, uh, Underground, was a DJ International, and basically all you know, uh, all all the uh, all the labels that were back then from Chicago. Where I supported all of them as long as the song was hot. I I played it. You know, there was nothing. There was nothing personal, nothing like that. We supported them. Mm-hmm. Oh. Well, you know, you know, me and Benji would talk a lot, and like I said, I was a kid during the time. You know, I can't say obviously I never was at the warehouse when Frankie was DJing at the warehouse. My mom went there. You know, now I did start DJing very early because I was a break dancer, and I would go see Julian at the Dillagas, which was called the Galaxy at the time, or I go to Main Street. And I would watch the DJs. That's what made me start buying the records and trying to DJ. But I think, I, I, you know, from the people I've talked to and from what I remember, from what I saw happen as the music developed, I know what I was thinking when I bought certain records. Um, you know, um, I know that the Southside guys like uh, Vincent, when they made On and On, I think they were trying to, you know, do something to music to be played at you know the power plant or the warehouse for Frankie to play it and I think Chippy when he made his house I think he was branding I think he literally branded the music for Chicago at that time and but I think I, I will always say that you know you got people that were guys that were initiating like Jesse Saunders and Vince Lawrence you know but you had DJs at the same time like Kenny Jason and Farley Jackmaster Funk and 
and um, Steve Hurley, and you had record record labels like DJ International or Sunset Records or Matt Warren, you know, that were coming after Mitch Ball and after um, Precision, you know, and then with tracks and DJ kind of started at the same time, you know, you, and you had, I think it just evolved and it all came together. Yeah, and, that's important. And it, it all came together and it created the sound of house music because, I mean, there were songs that were made back then that I was breakdancing to that I had no idea was supposed to be house music, you mm -hmm. know, and, um, you know, but at the same time, I do see, you know, how it built up and it just came together, you know, so I, and I know a lot of people want to, everybody, and, I, and I've seen this on, I know you've seen it on Facebook and guys arguing back and forth and, you know, but at the end of the day, it is something that we created here. It's something that was a culmination. It's not disco. I get tired of people saying house music is just disco change. No, house and disco are different. House was influenced by, was influenced by disco, but also yeah. by tallow disco. Also by the electronic music that was coming from New York, the, the stuff like Man Parish and Arthur Baker and them were doing. You know, there was a lot of influences. And when you guys put it all together, like you said at the beginning, when you guys were at AKs, when everybody, I don't care who DJ you were, if you were in Chicago, that's why BMX was so popular. It played a lot of different types of music. And you guys were able to mix all of that music together and keep it going. Uh, you know, and, and that created ambiance that made the sound of Chicago house music. Because, you know, I told Man Parrish when we interviewed him, I said, I told him, I said, you know, hip hop bebop, y'all call it hip hop bebop, but to us it was house. We play hip I heard Ron Hardy playing hip hop bebop, you know. <laughs> Yeah. We were thinking about when we were playing it and when we still do play it, it's part of the sound that we're creating in house music when we're playing records. Yes. And I think, I think one of the biggest tragedies I see with the newer DJs is guys who say, I play a certain type of music. I play techno house. I play garage. I play this. I play that. And like you said, I never, and then to this day, even when I'm mixing new stuff, is it a good record? Is it hidden? Can I blend it? Does it go with this? Can I make it do something? I don't care techno house, electro house, um, jack and house, deep house, whatever, afro house. It, they, they, is it good? <laughs> is it good? You, you know, know what? Back then, let me tell you. Why back then when I started DJ, there was only two type of of. I don't know. It's called. There was no. There was no genre called. Uh, there was no word back then called like that. You either like rock and rock and roll music or you like dance music. That was it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Dance music cover everything that was coming out of everywhere. The Italo, New York, uh, the post disco, the disco stuff. That was all dance music. And then you have the rock music where you have the Rolling Stones, the Who, and all that, you know, all the classic rock and roll, you know. So either you like that or you like that. Some people like both, you know. I, I mean, I was very open minded and I listened to all kinds of music. So, uh, you know, I listened to rock, I listened to, to it, uh, Latin, Latin music. And, and of course, my love, which is a dance music. Um, but yeah, back then there was no no separations of, of all these these different branches, you know. Yeah. So you like rock or you like dance music. And and as, as as you could see, if you remember some of my early mixes, uh, you could see that I was mixing what they call freestyle with house with Italo. You know, it's also a whole mixture of stuff because there was no there was no separation. Now there is. Yeah, big time. And I yeah. think we started seeing that towards the end of our little era. Let's get about 87, 88, 89. You started seeing a separation out again of the freestyle and then the so-called deep house and then the Chicago house. And, you know, and then everybody else in the world just kept playing music in New York and London and Manchester and Berlin. They is, they still play good music. Whatever it is, is good. If it's good, they're going to play it. My thing is, um, you know, when I talked to Vince uh, last week, I interviewed him. And, you know, when we and Benji would talk and then I would talk to Vince and I understand where Vince and them are coming from because, you know, time frame when they made on and on, I think they had an intention. Uh, at least Vince had an intention, you know, because of being around Frankie, being at the different clubs, Sawyer's and uh, the playground and all that stuff. And with Farley and them playing these records, and I think, like I said, it all came together because you guys were pushing a line on these records. You guys were playing them everywhere, not just on the south side. You guys were playing them up north. I was out in freaking 40 miles away in Aurora playing on and on and all that stuff, you know. So I think that we have to understand, yeah, there are people who may have had the first label, who may have made some of the first records. 
but I think it was a, a still collective effort of people playing the music, pushing the line, and and just playing good music and getting people used to the, how we were blending records and and getting the crowd into this 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 zone, you know, that they that they were just and we could play new record, we could break new records and. You know, people wanted to hear new stuff. You know, we wanted to be the first ones. When Ben oh, yeah. the test person one time, I lost my mind. You know, I was like, "Oh, I got the first one." You know, and I'm out. You know, it's just it was a, a fun era. Yeah, yeah, and, and you know, uh, and like you mentioned, man, this is this is was more like a like a, a whole group effort that, without knowing really, you know, n nobody was like I was talking to the guys in the south side. Hey, you know, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. It was without knowing because I, I, a lot of times I, I, I never met those guys until much later on time, you know, in my life, you know. Uh, so I think um, this became, I think, one of the main things that that open up, open up the channels for everybody to listen to this music was the radio. You know, mm -hmm. it's sad to hear. Uh, you know, this is something that Benji used to bring to me that uh, some of, some of the some of the early artists from from uh, making this house music saying well you know the mac the hot mix five really didn't do, didn't do anything for me you know uh, okay. it was frank you know and i'm sorry not like that, that doesn't even make sense because mm -hmm. yeah frankie knuckles had a whole bunch of followers and group but how many people could you put on the power plant how many people were you able to put in the warehouse maybe 500 people i don't think all right where where the communication of the of the radio we 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 were up to several million listeners a week well, well let me be clear i'm be honest with you um if it i see again people keep thinking that it was just their little part of the world but it was all of chicago it was all of the suburbs and like for example my introduction to um you was on the radio all right and my introduction to someone like Lil Lewis was Farley playing How I Feel and Frequency. I didn't know who Lil Lewis was. I'm not from Chicago, but I heard the record. And when I went to Imports to say, I want this record frequency that Farley played, then I saw his name. And then I look at the flyers that they were all there. And I see he's, you know, part of this Diamond Core production. Yeah. So I want to go to one of his parties now. I would have never known who Lil Lewis was, you know. Yeah. Um I think that again, you make the records, but there has to be someone playing the records. There has to be someone distributing the records. But to get it out further than just the one club where you know the DJ, you give it to him, he plays it. This is one little, little group of people. It became something where, I, like, take a Donna song, "Rocking Down the House." Mm -hmm. Rocking down the house. I'm out in the roar DJing at a party at eight o'clock at night, and I'm playing a "Rocking Down the House." Then I go to Addison and Dilla Gavs and Julian lets me get on and I'm playing rocking down the house. Crowds react in the same way. Then I'll go to one of Mr. Batoy's parties at, 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 at Rainbow and crowds still losing. Then I'll go, hey, let's go check out, you know, Ron Hardy. You know, we go into the music box or the power, or the power play and we listen to um, Powerhouse and we listen to Ron playing it in a different version, beating the brakes off of a crowd losing their damn mind. And so it was a point in time when everybody liked I don't care, black crowd, white crowd, Asian crowd, suburban crowd, South Side crowd, gay crowd, state, straight crowd. It was about everything. And, and it, it, the yeah. cooperation, man. It was it was everybody coming together. And I think that's what made house big. It was it was the togetherness that we all have without even knowing each other. Exactly. You know, I mean it, I mean, I, I I'm basically from the north side. You know, I grew up in the north side and I know basically a lot of the DJs from the north side. And, and a lot of them were pushing the stuff way, way early in the days, you know. So, I mean, and, and they deserve credit, you know. Uh, you know, they deserve whether they're Latino, black or, or white, you know, uh, because they they put their they put their contribution into the music, you know. And, and it's, um, I mean, I, I don't know if it's sad or anything, but um, to, to see it getting loosened, the prestige of the house music from Chicago, to all the countries, you know, it's like, well, you know, it's just maybe because we're not together, we're not doing this together, everybody's kind of doing their own thing, you know. Uh, all I know is that I, I supported every single artist that came out of Chicago. I play, uh, you, can see, you can hear some of my early mixes out there, people have posted stuff, and, and I, try to, I try to support everybody, 
whether, like I said, they were from the south side, the west side, or the north side. Because we have a lot of guys from the north side that did a lot of music. We got Gary Wallace, you know, uh, Jungle George, um, you know, Jesse Velez, rest in peace, is one of the mm -hmm. first guys to put it, uh, something in Trax Records. Um, you know, Hula Hula. Mm -hmm. uh, he's also a lot of, we lost a lot of, a lot of, a lot of uh, DJs from back in the day. And I know. think, wasn't Joe Smooth, isn't he from the north side? I think so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, so. I mean, we know how much he did for the music. Yeah, look, look at that. I, I, I guess the tragedy I see, all right, like, all right, hip-hop went across the world. Hip-hop is everywhere. Started yeah. in New York. But New York still is hip-hop. You know, when you think hip-hop, you think New York, you still get good stuff coming out of New York City. Chicago, I think part of the problem is that, you know, we got a faction of people that want to say it was just something happened in the uh, house music was something that just happened in the gay community. And some people want to say it was just a black thing, you know, or a South side thing or North side thing. And ultimately it was everybody thing. That's what made it house. I could only, like I, like I mentioned to you earlier, I was there. Okay. Mm -hmm. I was there before the whole thing started. I was there during the whole thing going, you know, we had our own record label and everything. We put out all these records and I could tell you before what I saw, it was, it was a combination of everybody's that made house music the highest one. Mm -hmm. it, it, can't, can't change that. There's a lot of articles I read on the on, on, on the internet. There's there's documentaries I see, and, and I'm gonna have to disagree with a lot of the stuff they say. You, you if you want to give credit to the house music uh, contributors, you gotta mention a whole bunch of from all parts of Chicago. Absolutely. You know, and it's just this is just what it is. You know, I mean, I, I like I said, I, I I don't come here to burn anybody. I don't want to disrespect anybody when it comes to that. But let's let's talk the facts. You know. Well, I don't think I don't think you're disrespecting anybody by saying that. I mean, it's a true thing. And like I said, I've interviewed Mark Imperial. You know, who was out here in Downers Grove. He was out in the West Suburbs making house music. Uh, my kid, Man Wilson, was out in Aurora making house music steve you know you had steve hurley making house music people from out south you had people from up north you had people everywhere that were becoming part of this thing and pushing the line for it and it made it the worldwide phenomenon it is you know a lot of contributors yeah and nobody knew i mean i didn't know some of those cats didn't know that this thing was going to explode the way it did all over the world nobody i i think uh, i think the cats that came after us were the ones that actually benefited because uh, the house music was, and to me especially, open up, open up some roads. You know, I was able to go to Europe because you know, and I, I heard a documentary the other day, uh, and somebody was interviewed. Like, well, I don't know the house music five ever went to uh, Europe. I don't think none of this guy ever went there. I'm like, listen, we we paved the way for a lot of people to go to Europe. Uh, we were there. I mean, some of the guys from the Hot Mix Five were there, okay, and we were there when the the, the beginning of the stuff when when they were paying us, you know, not a lot of money, you mm -hmm. know. But I think we opened up we opened up the road for a lot of people, like maybe uh, Sneak, um, Derek Carter, and all these guys that came after us. That they, they they continued with the road, you know, and they were able to to get to get being known all over the world, you know, bad boy Bill, he continued doing his thing. Mm -hmm. So, so, you know, it's like we continue and, and I'm, 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 I'm never been a hater, man. I, I think that I, I, I'm grateful that they still doing it because I'm going to tell you what, because if some of these guys or some of the newer guys from Chicago are still doing it overseas, it opens still the, the doors for us. That's why at this, at this point, I'm still doing it. You know, because of these guys, they keep they keeping they keeping the music alive. Even even though it's little, it's not like it used to be back in the eighties and early nineties. But they she's still keeping the, the 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 music from Chicago still lit a little bit, where we're able to still have that door open for us to do something. You know. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm gonna say this much, and you know, like I said, I don't have a dog in the fight. I wasn't a member of the Hot Mix Five. I didn't put out records on DJ International. You know, I wasn't on, I wasn't at the warehouse. Like I said, my mom was, 
you know, I'll say this much. Um, I respect all of you guys. Um, you know, um, I've got to know a lot of you guys personally when I was a kid, got to know Farley and, and, you know, I respect Farley. That's like, you know, Farley's like the, the king of house music to me. Cause you know, I just have known him that long Julian, you know, who spent time with us and showed us basically the importance of being on beat and not falling off, you know, and there's just so many people that I've got to know, but I'll say this. The Hot Mix 5 is one of the most essential things. And WBMX, the, the, the radio station, those two things are part of the most essential things that made house music what it is. Right. I mean, you had the people making the records, you know, Jesse Records and Mitch Ball Records and later DJ International Tracks, you know, and all the other labels that came. You also had the clubs all from the north side to the south side, all the clubs, the parties at Mendel, the parties at the Rainbow, the parties out at our skating rinks out here. All of that stuff is essential to what made this what it is. And honestly, the Hot Mix 5, like I said, there's a lot of people I never would have heard of if it wasn't for the Hot Mix 5. You know, um, the stuff you guys play from Detroit. I would have known who Derek May or Juan Atkins or Kevin Saunderson was if I didn't hear you guys playing no UFOs or playing Groove Without a Doubt, you know, or later on playing Mayday stuff, you know. And they'll even say, when you talk to those guys, they'll tell you how influenced they were when they would be able to pick up those radio stations from Chicago, you know, with their with their receivers, their powerful receivers, and listen to what you guys are doing here. So I don't think that anyone being fair or being real would try to minimize the fact the the, the impact of Mix 5. Because like I said, I knew Farley was going overseas. Steve went over there. He won that award with Jack Your Body. That opened the door for everybody. And ultimately speaking, Every single DJ who mixes now bases their sound. And, you know, the Chicago DJs are the best DJs in the world. I'm going to say that number one. I would say that, yeah. Yeah, because of, of how we blend and remix records. And everybody else is doing it, is predicating it on what we do. And what we do, we're predicating on what we got from the Hot Mix 5. And that's the truth. Yeah. So people can say what they want to say. Yeah. But you know what? I, I, like you said, I, I think even though a lot of people were not part of the Hot Mix 5, or the radio, everybody like yourself contribute because if if you were playing in Aurora or on the west side or 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 the west suburbs, you are exposing the music to a lot of people. And and and, and it's truly, truly, you know, people remember that. You know, I mean, you see all the all the crowds now that we you know we're still playing. And a lot of people are like, hey, you know, I grew up in Aurora, I grew up in Joliet, and I grew up in Downsville, whatever, man, and and you know, this music is my music, you know. So it, it didn't matter whether you were on the radio or not, but I think the contribution of everybody, every DJ that was out here uh, exposing the music, man, it deserves uh, deserves credit. Mm -hmm. You know, I think us being on the radio, yeah, of course we 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 expose the music to a lot millions of people, but you guys also bring the the, the music to the clubs. It exposes it. You know, I see what you mean. And the people grew up with it. You know. Yeah, this is a soundtrack of a lot of people's lives. You know, that's why they, you know, I know a lot of guys get tired of the, uh, some of the DJs, like, oh, I want to play, I don't want to play old school all the time. I like playing the new music. Yeah. But when I was talking to Vince and we were talking about, you know, on and on and, and we were talking about Undercover and Funk You Up, I'm like, man. And we started talking about Frankie and Jamie Principal's song, Waiting on the Angel. And I'm like, I'm going to go do old school mix. You know, it just makes you want to go hear the music. Because yeah. it was so important to us and it was such a part of our lives and all the memories are there. And it was just a moment in time, the beginning of house music, just like in New York. I'm sure that they can remember the beginnings of when they were b-boying and break dancing and the music that was being played. You know, it's important, you know, and I'm glad that, yeah. you know, it's like I said, this is one of the reasons I do the show so we can get everybody have a voice and yeah. say what they witnessed, what they saw. You know, because it all paints the complete picture of what it was to be in Chicago in the 80s to be part of house music yeah. as, it's, it, as it began. It's, it's great that you're doing this because you actually, like I say, you're getting, you're getting the, 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 the experience of everybody what lived through you. Know? And I think it's great. So, all right. <laughs> yeah, I don't kept you an hour and a half, man. It, it, <laughs> I want to add one more thing because this is... But, that that we having with a lot of the, the new jacks coming out, a lot of the new DJs coming out now, and and and, and I see that a lot on Facebook that you know, all these DJs is talking is talking the past, you know, 
they're stuck in the past, they keep playing the same thing, you go to the clubs, they play the same thing. Well, let me let me tell you something, okay? Uh, it is very hard in the city for some reason, in this city, to play something different. For some reason, uh, when I get hired to do a show or in a club, people expect me to work, to, to play the old school, Chicago. Now, I'll tell you one thing, I, I'm, I'm tired. I'm tired of a lot of songs, you know? I'm like, man, I played this song like a million times back in the day, I don't want to. You know, <clears throat> but people have to understand that we have to play for the crowd. So, and I, I'm getting paid to play for the crowd. So that's what I'm going to do. I do follow a lot of stuff. I, I follow what's going on because sadly right now we're looking at what New York is doing, you know, and what, what, uh, what, what England's doing, what, uh, what France is doing, you know, with all the DJs over there, because they basically, you know, they basically mon monopolized the, the, the industry right now. You know, they're looking at all the DJs from over there. You know, I'm looking at uh, what what uh, the EDM didn't really attract me much. You know, uh, the thing that attracted me the most right now has been all the old disco that they're redoing, and I'm all into that, man. Because a lot of these a lot of these guys are remixing some of these old songs and they're making them really nice, and that's what I I love to play. I love, love to I love to play some of the new stuff, uh, some of the soulful house. What they call it, soulful house. I like a lot of the stuff. And and I, I try to keep up, man. I try to keep I keep up with a lot of stuff that's going on overseas. Uh, you know, I, I know what the, uh, you know uh, a lot of the DJs over are doing. You know, uh, I listen to some of the shows that one of the biggest shows that I listen to is uh, uh, Glitterbox mm -hmm. from London. You know, and I like I listen to what they playing. You know, I listen to what they're into it. I look at some of the parties they want. You know, and I try to keep up with a lot of this stuff, man. And I, so, sometimes it'll be one or two good songs. They're like, oh, man, I could play that. You know, I could play that. Uh, you know, that they, they got this guy, uh, this Purple Machine. Uh, he did a couple uh, remixes, uh, Sylvester mix, remixes. And I man, played the hell out of them. You know, I've, I've been playing at this club in Cicero. And I, and I played the hell out of them because they got a good rhythm. Uh, the thing about it is, like you said, man, is that people, uh, it is hard for us to, try to throw a whole set of new music because you're going to have people looking at you like, you know, yeah. and it's hard. They, people don't understand. A lot of these new DJs, why is this guy playing the same old? You have no choice sometimes, yeah. you know. What I try to do is I try to do my own remixes because if I hear this song in the 80s for a million times, I don't want to hear the same thing. So what I, I try to do, shoot some changes on it, you know, that they keep me a little bit more interested, keep a, people a little bit more interested, you know. So, yeah, it just... It is just a word, you know, that uh, we don't, we're not stuck in the past. Right. Well, you know, one of the things I wanted to point out, though, you know, yeah, I understand. Because, like, I, I, one time I did a, a mix of all new music and I sent it to some friends and they're like, yeah, uh, send me an old school mix. And I realized then that, you know, people, that's their memories and that's what they want to hear. And if you, like you said, if you're getting paid to play, you got to pay, play what people want to hear. I the think. One of the bigger problems we have in Chicago is that we lost the youth at some point, you know, where like if you go to Europe, if you're in England or if you're in Germany or France or Italy or if you're in South Africa or down in South America, there's young people listening to this stuff. We don't have a lot of young people. You know, we don't have that young crowd that we can push this the new stuff to. And we don't have radio support in our city, number one. We don't have club support in our city because our clubs try to be so racial all the time. They're afraid if we play anything with too much rhythm, it'd be too many blacks, Latinos sh show up, you know? So it's, we got a lot of obstacles here that you don't have in New York, that you don't have in LA, you know? And again, because remember it was a collective effort. There were a lot of clubs that teen clubs that we could go to. Remember, these are all teen clubs. Oh yeah. When I went to Dillagas, it was a teen club. When I would go, to AKs, it was a teen night. When I went to the Rainbow, it, Tony was doing teen nights. Um, when I would go to the Music Box, when I, or, or, or the the Powerhouse, those were you know I was able to get in as a teenager, you know, and all the sets we did at Centrium Hall or wherever we rented out was basically aimed at teenagers. So the music was young. Now when I look at all these house festivals, I look out, I don't see, I see a lot of us older people. You know, we might drag our kids along, you know, but at some point. We're gonna need somehow. It's gonna to have to. We gotta have to get that our music into that young crowd again, and, and get a newer crowd of people that's interested in hearing newer stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and you know what? Uh, I mean, we do have the, the, some of the young crowd that they get into this music, and I say, I see, but not 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 the volumes that we see back in the day. Because mm -hmm. younger ones, you know, they're like listening to uh, some of the old school, and they like it. You know, like wow, they get into it. They know the, the songs and the music. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a lot of the youth, the all the youth, they get into the dance music. They get more into the EDM stuff. And they got the little clicks, you know, like you have the little clicks uh, in the near north side of Chicago, you know, they, they, uh, they, they have, uh, they, 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 I think they had the, the history a little twisted. I even got into an argument with some of, some of these uh, so-called DJs now that, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, when you try to disagree on a couple of things, uh, you know, we, I, I disagree on some of the things that we were talking about. Uh, about Frankie, you know, and I know Frankie, uh, you know, he was, he was a man, you know, I, mm -hmm. bro, I mean, he influenced me a lot. Uh, but, you know, but mm -hmm. I also know what I saw, you know, uh, and when you try to contradict some of the stuff, beliefs that they have, they, they're passionate about it, man. They're like, oh, you can't say that about Frankie. Oh, oh you, I go, fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. People get fanatical about Frankie now because I'm very yeah. careful. I'm always yeah. careful when I talk about the history of Frankie um, because, um, like I said, people can get kind of fanatical. Um, yes. The only people who are worse on you than Frankie Knuckles fans is Beyonce fans if you say the wrong thing. But yeah. with, with um, I'm going to be honest, a lot of these DJs and a lot of these people out here talking about they were at the warehouse, no, you were 8, 9, 10, or 11. You were not there. Your parents might have been. Secondly, um, Frankie, I listened to Frankie DJ. I'm gonna be honest, I'm gonna say this, I'm probably gonna lose some people on this. I was never impressed with Frankie Knuckles as a DJ. Now there's a reason for that. The reason is because I came up listening to Kenny Jam and Jason and Farley Jack Master Funk and and uh you know and um Andre Hatchet and and um people and Ron Hardy, people like that. So I was used to people blending records. For, when I heard Frankie, he wasn't really blending. And he wasn't blending too well. Not that I'm saying that that makes him a bad DJ. It's just I wasn't accustomed to that. I was accustomed to DJs making music with music, blending records like we talked about. And I think that that thing that we started doing, that you guys started doing first, is what makes Chicago Chicago. And that's where the greatness came from. I mean, I put Ron Hardy right up there with Frankie. I put Farley right up there with them. You know, I put Kenny Jason right up there with them because of the con contributions they did to DJing. They're and a lot of people don't want to hear that, you yeah. know. And they get passionate, you know, and then, then they start hitting you, you know. Mm -hmm. so, like, I love those places when they used to I go to the Wicker Park area, man. I love it because you I could play anything. You could play, I could play all this, this new disco stuff that I'm playing right now. And they love it, you know. They, they're open-minded to that, but... You have to be careful and also what you say because like i said i, I get into an argument and like oh you can't talk about that blah, blah, blah. i'm like <laughs> this story you know you don't know the story and like i said uh you know a lot of people don't want to hear it you know they want to hear it i mean i i mean we try we try to get frankie into the radio you know that yeah i remember i mix five try to get frankie into the radio and, and the radio said oh The radio was more accustomed to what we were doing with doing turbulism, you know, the tricks that we were doing. And truth, you know, I was yeah. there. I saw that, you know. So, and, and, and but you said something like this, you know, oh, you can't say anything about, you know, you know. Yeah, I, I respect the man. Like I said, he was a big influence. Yeah, well, I mean, the myth of uh, the myth that I hear, I. What made me really start talking about this as a historian, not just as a DJ, because I'm also a historian. And what made me start talking about it is when I go places across the country and I'll say I'm from Chicago and you know, I'm a DJ and we talk. And then they tell me this story that Frankie Knuckles came to town one day and he gave Chicago house music. I'm like, yeah, no, that didn't happen. That's not what happened. You know, that's not what happened. But there are so many people committed to that narrative. I mean, we saw a whole documentary on, I saw a documentary on Netflix that talked about basically Frankie Knuckles brought disco, the post-disco prelude stuff from the Paradise Garage in New York and came to Chicago and they opened this wonderful place called The Warehouse and house music was given to Chicago by New York. And I'm like, no, that's not what happened. 
Um, you know, that's not what happened. I mean, yeah, he did come to Chicago from New York and he DJ with, uh, you know, out there with, with, the, with the boys in New York, you know, uh, what was it? Uh, what was the guy's name? Um, Larry Levan, Larry yeah. Levan. Yeah. And you know, don't get me wrong. There's guys out there doing their thing. Um, you know, Tony Humphreys was doing this thing in, in, in uh, New Jersey, very good DJ. And they had their own little scene at a scene in Baltimore, but at the end of the day, you know, Chicago was built. Frankie came and that club did do some powerful things, but Chicago was built by Ron Hardy, Jesse Saunders, Vince Lawrence, you, Farley. Uh, Julie, that's how Chicago was built. Yes, correct. And you and, and I totally agree with you. I totally agree with you. I mean, everybody had their contribution. He was a big part of it. You know, he does. He was a big part of it. He was there. Uh, yeah. And, like I said, he influenced not just me, he influenced a lot of people, you know, and becoming DJ um, and music. But, you know, let's let's talk the real stuff, you know, let's, let's talk what really happened. Mm -hmm. Talking, uh, you know, for all I know in my career, uh, dealing with, with New York DJs, a lot of them didn't like us. I never, they never really liked us. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, they never really care about the, the, anybody from Chicago, you know. Uh, and now I see a lot of them saying, oh, uh, uh, I love Chicago music. I love house music. When back in the day, you say, I want nothing to do with Chicago house music. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's just, you know, but I, I could understand. I mean, it's business a business. You're making a, li a living out of it, you know. And, and, and you got to please the crowd, you know. You got to please your audience. You know, so you know, it is what it is. All I can say is this: no matter where you come from, from the south side, the west side, the, the north side, and even from New York, at this point, if people are keeping the house music alive, that means that I keep doing this. I keep doing something I love dearly, which mm -hmm. is, which is the house music. Uh, you know, it, it, that's my point, man. Mm -hmm. As long as as long as these guys keep going, uh, 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 anybody from Chicago that goes uh, overseas, it's a good thing, man. It's mm -hmm. a good thing. They're going to probably look at me late next time, you know? Mm -hmm. So, and, and that's what we're working on. Uh, uh, Mickey and I, we've been uh, talking to overseas, you know, trying to get something together. You know, the the, the pandemic kind of messed up some things when it came down to this, uh, to the music, you know, DJs. Mm -hmm. Open up, yeah. We'll, we'll go back over. All right. Well, Mr. Diaz, I'm not going to keep you much longer. Obviously, we have an hour and 45. I would <laughs> like to invite you back again, like maybe um in about three or four weeks, if you have time, because I know you're busy, you know, and um just because I know there were so many other questions that people wanted me to ask you, I didn't get to ask you, and some questions I wanted to ask you myself. And uh, just to get some clarity on things, you know, because like I said, I think that from the interviews I've done thus far, I think people are getting a broader picture of everything that happened. And that's the point of this, so, you know, to get a, to nail down that this history, what it was, you know, everybody did so many wonderful things to, to forward the music. So, yeah, um, I, I think I'm sorry. I think that a lot of the stuff that's and then it's inaccurate. It's incomplete. I, I, I watched some of the stuff that about. And I, I, don't, I, a lot of them is pretty accurate, but I think a lot of it is in, it's incomplete. Oh, it's very incomplete. Not telling the whole thing. You know? Yeah, well, it was incomplete because unfortunately, now this is me as a historian talking, not as a DJ. Um, as a historian, you have people who have their point of view. Like, um, for example, um, let's talk. I mean, not to get off subject, but the Bible. There are four Gospels in the Bible. Four different writers four different viewpoints of the events that happened. All of them are telling the truth, but they're telling it from their perspective. So it's not that someone's not telling the truth, they're telling their part, you know, and everything else is peripheral. So as a historian, if I wanted to get an accurate history of something, like with those four gospels, I'm gonna get different people, all right, from different areas, and I'm gonna line the timelines up, and then that's how I get a complete picture. Now, I've done that for the most part. I know the time frames when Kenny Jason started DJing on DAI, 
when we first, you know, when they what they were playing. I know about Herb Kent when he was playing the punk out music. I know when BMX went in the air and the program that they did. I know when GCI tried to, you know, was losing the BMX. You know, I know when that when this record came out at this time. This wasn't the first one because this is when it came out, you know. Yeah. But I also know when Chip came out with its house and branded things, it might have been later than that first record, but yeah. that's when everybody was like, it's house, it's house, it's house. And it said something, yeah. you know? So I know when Music is a Key came out when the first time really that someone said, I'm making a house music record that I want to get played on regular radio with vocals and a chorus and all the things that a record's supposed to have. So there are a lot of things that happen and there's a history there and it's the truth. You know, it's not that anyone's lying that they say, well, I made the first house record when I made this one. No, that is absolutely true. You did make the first record and we all played and we still bang that particular record. But it's also true. Well, I made a record that branded house music because it said it's house is out. That is also true, you know, and, you know, and, and well, we were pushing the music on the radio to the whole Chicagoland area and parts of Milwaukee. Also true, you know, so there's a lot of truth and we just lining it up so everybody can see that, you know, see everybody's contribution to what, to what to this, this wonderful thing that we made. And it's, it's much appreciated because you are, you know, again, to the root of things and uh, to the, you know, the, the real story. Yeah. Well, uh, once again, I appreciate you, Mr. Diaz. Again, always been a fan of your music, always been a fan of your DJ. And, um, you know, um, yeah, tell Mickey he need to get back. I, I don't want to get Mickey on. He said he was going to do it. So tell me to get with me. And I'm a, Send a message out to Matt Warren, too, because uh, his label Sunset Records, I think, doesn't get the respect or the credit that it gets. I remember when Ralphie did Razzmatazz on that label, and we played the hell out of Razzmatazz. I don't care if it was a black club, white club, Latin club, mixed club. Razzmatazz got played, you know, and it was Latin based, but it it rocked the party. But that's a different discussion, <laughs> you know. Um uh, and you know, like I said, uh, I appreciate you guys all taking the time, all of you. And I was to want to thank everybody who's been on thus far. Um, you know, all the from Hitman to Man Parish to um, you know Tony Batoy, Vince Lawrence, Mark Imperial, Jesse De La Pena, Bucky Fargo, uh, Tyree Cooper, Byron Stingley. You know, and if I miss anybody, I apologize. But I, I'm just thankful for all you guys giving me your part, your time. Cause I'm fans of all of you. Everyone I mentioned, I've been a fan of your music for at least I'm 51. So I would have to say I've been fans of some of y'all for damn near 40 years. You know what I'm saying? I think the only thing I've liked longer than y'all has been craft work and prints. You know? <laughs> all good, man. It's all good stuff. <laughs> but um, like I said, I, I would like to have you on again, you know, um, you know, in a few weeks, I'll have Mr. Patoy on again. And just because there's just so much you guys, well, I'm having Vince back on again. It's just there's so much you guys saw. And then, and, and like with Vince, the conversation went a complete different direction. I was like, oh, and he told me some stuff I had no idea happened. And he it, made it very clear. It's, you know? too, it's, it's way too much. Maybe that's why a lot of people just want to show it up. Hey, we make house music here and that's it. But yeah. it's, it's a broader uh, thing, man. It's, it's a lot bigger than 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 anybody you know could think of. You know, it, it's going to take some time to. If, yeah. I mean, taking the time to do this, it's gonna it's gonna take you a little while, man, to get this together. <laughs> yeah, but I appreciate it. So anyway, I'm gonna let you go. I kept you for almost two hours. My bad. Hey, no problem. Right. Appreciate we'll it. Talk, we'll talk again. Thanks for everybody. Please like and subscribe us on the YouTube channel and on the Facebook page. We appreciate it. And once again, thanks again for tuning into the History of House. Peace. Mm -hmm.